future scientists, it's me, Mr. Miller. This video is all about uh, the endosymbiosis theory. So the endosymbiosis theory is uh, scientists' best explanation as to how the first uh, complex, well, I shouldn't say complex, the first cell, a living cell, uh, came about. So, um, endo, the word endo means inside, sim means together, and bio means life. So, endosymbiosis theory is basically the uh, living together inside kind of what that roughly translates to. But what that means is that uh, one cell lived inside of another cell and the two actually co-evolved together to become one and the same. I'll explain more. Uh, so this, the theory states that you have a big cell, and let's call this big cell one, and then you have a smaller cell, let's call this smaller cell too, okay? Now, so in the early Earth, in the, what we call the primordial soup, I'll go ahead and write that down. In the primordial soup, we know from the last video, and the, when we talked about the abiogenesis theory, uh, we know that we could create biomolecules, or in other words, the molecules necessary for life to exist, uh, which are carbs, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids, could be formed from non-living elements, specifically carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and nitrogen. Okay. So these things would come together to make biomolecules. The biomolecules would come together over time I mean a long period of time, I'm talking about millions, tens of millions, maybe even hundreds of millions of years that it took just to make these very small gradual steps towards life as we know it today. Um, so at some point though, you did have uh, cells. You had small, simple cells just kind of floating around in the soup. And at some point, uh, one cell, was maybe consumed by another cell. So let's say that small cell two, you know, big cell one, uh, let's say he, he floats around and uh, to get the nutrients that big cell one needs to continue existing, he has to take them from uh, other cells, kind of like the same way that we have to eat food in order to survive and be able to continue living. Uh, the early cells had to continue living and perhaps they took nutrients from their environment, even from other cells if they had to, uh, in order to stay alive. And so uh, maybe big cell one came across big cell two someday while he's just floating around doing what he normally does. Um, and then he eats this guy, but little cell two has, let's call it a mutation. Because that's what it would have been called. But uh, perhaps this cell has the ability to do something that not many other cells can do. Uh, maybe this mutation gives this cell the ability to prevent it from being digested by larger cells like big cell one. So big cell one ingests big cell two, and the plan is to take big cell two and eat it, just like he does all the other smaller cells that are floating around. But because little cell two has this mutation that makes it extra resistant to being eaten and digested, it just sticks around. 
Let's also throw in the fact that, hey, perhaps this cell, little cell two, doesn't just have a mutation that keeps it from being digested, but also lets it create energy um, in one way or another. Let's say sunlight, okay? Let's say little cell two has the ability to take sunlight and it's figured out how to take sunlight energy or light energy and turn it into what we call chemical energy. I'll just put chem energy that it can then use to power itself. So this guy gets eaten by big cell one and big cell one is like, hey, I'm trying to eat you, why won't you dissolve? And then little cell two says, well, because I have a mutation that keeps me from doing it and I have a second mutation that also allows me to convert sunlight into energy to power my processes. And then big cell one says, hey, that's a great idea. Can I get me some of that energy? Sure, just don't kill me. And so the two actually end up living together and they co-evolve over time to the point to where little cell two actually becomes part of big cell one. And this is really the endosymbiosis theory in a nutshell that a big cell ingested a small cell at some point throughout history, and that small cell was not digested, had some sort of a beneficial um, effect on cell one to, to the point to where it actually benefited both to be with each other more so than if they were separate. So it's kind of a mutual uh, deal. Number two gets protection from the outside world. He gets to stay in his own little enclosed environment, safe and sound. Big cell one gets some uh, free energy that perhaps they did not uh, plan on getting. And so it kind of works out. Now over time, this thing would have evolved into a modern day plant cell. It makes sense because if little cell two can turn sunlight into energy, then that is what photosynthesis is. So this cell would eventually evolve into a plant cell. And there's uh, another type of small cell that could have been involved as well. And the same thing gets ingested by big cell one. So now you can see how over time these big cells could ingest more and more small cells and assuming that they are able to live together can actually benefit each other and become one and the same. And cells over time could become more and more complex. So what we think uh, cell two became was the modern day chloroplast, which is an organelle that exists in plant cells. And that's where photosynthesis happens. So perhaps that's this guy in here. He's now in the modern day plant cell doing photosynthesis. And number three, could have turned into what we now refer to as a mitochondria, which is an organelle. It's another type of organelle that exists in um, animal cells. And that actually creates energy, instead of using sunlight, it actually creates energy uh, from chemicals. So it just converts one type of chemical energy into uh, another type of energy that your cells in your body use to power their functions.
So that's the idea of how small cells got ingested by larger cells, became partners, co-evolved over time. Now today they play very important roles in modern day cells.